Hello everyone, my name is Sebastian, and I'm the CTO and co-founder of DC Spark, a crypto ecosystem builder company who's also involved in the Cardano project. I was talking earlier today on a show called Epochs End, a Twitter space called Epochs End, and I was talking about transaction finality and transaction assurance on the Cardano blockchain. And I was trying to describe what exactly this means and how this affects dApps on Cardano and how stake pool operators play a role in the finality of the Cardano blockchain. I also didn't have time to talk about it, but actually this is a known problem. It affects Cardano, it affects Twitter, or not Twitter, it affects uh, Bitcoin, it affects Ethereum, it affects every single uh, project that uses Nakamoto consensus. And so I want to talk about, you know, solutions to this problem, because this, this is a very well-known problem and people have solutions. In fact, at DC Spark, we proposed a way to tackle this problem as part of Fund 6. And IHG has a different way to tackle this problem that they call Hydra. So if you've heard of Hydra, this is one way to tackle this problem. So in this video, I'm going to kind of describe uh, what is transaction assurance, what is finality, and we're going to talk about how stake pools affect this, and the po possible solutions. That way, even if you're not really familiar with this topic, you can hopefully uh, understand a little bit more by the end of this video. So to start off, I'm going to give you a very simple example of what can happen. That's kind of an extreme case, but I think this will help you a lot understand mentally how this works. So imagine you have the Cardano blockchain, the current day Cardano blockchain. Everybody who's writing a stake pool right now has a version of the Cardano blockchain in their computer, in their transaction history, right? And so let's call this a common prefix. It's a common piece of the blockchain that everybody has. Now imagine you have a stake pool that decides that they're no longer going to accept blocks by anybody else. Basically they change their, the code on their machine and says, if a block is made by somebody else, just ignore it. Don't add it to the blockchain, just ignore it. Only add blocks made by uh, myself. So they will basically have a version of Cardano that has this con prefix, has the same part of history everybody else has. And then they'll fork off of this and they'll only have blocks made by them as part of their transaction history. Now, obviously everybody else will not follow this rule. And so there'll be a different version of the Cardano blockchain where everybody else is participating. So you have a version of the Cardano blockchain with just one person making blocks occasionally, and then everybody else on a different chain. Now, the question is, if we give these two blockchains to somebody, how do they know which one is the real blockchain? They both have blocks in them, right? So how do you know which one is the true version of the blockchain? Now, because it's a decentralized block, uh, a decentralized protocol, I gave you kind of a simple example, but this can happen in much more complex ways. You can have two people creating a fork, three people creating a fork, you have multiple forks going together. And so whenever you're syncing a Cardano node, like imagine you download Daedalus for the first time, you're syncing a Cardano full node. How do you know, how does your computer know which version of the Cardano blockchain that it sees is the real one? You want to go on the one with, with everybody participating, right? You don't want to go on the small fork. Now, the way they do this is actually with Ouroboros Genesis. So if you read the Ouroboros Genesis paper, which was published a few years ago by IOSK, it describes exactly how to solve this problem in Cardano and proof of stake networks. So that's why if you ever heard the term that Ouroboros Genesis adds bootstrap from Genesis as um, the key feature, that's what it means. It means that you can start from scratch. You can start from a clean installation of data lists and your computer has an algorithm to know which one is the true version of the blockchain and discard all the other ones. Now, the way they do this is with some statistics, some statistics and analysis of the blockchain and which version of the blockchain has the most blocks by the most actors. It's a very complex discussion and we won't go over it in, in this video. But the important thing I want to talk about is that um, because there can be multiple versions of the Cardano blockchain, it means that you know your computer has to figure out which one is, a, is the true version. There is no kind of true version of Cardano until your computer can look at all the different options out there and kind of think, okay, I think this is the true one. And so in our example, we're talking about, you know, this kind of fork that happened with many blocks, right? So we had many blocks on the real version of Cardano and many blocks on the kind of version where it's just run by one person. Now, this is kind of an easy example to tell if, if I describe it to you verbally, you know, okay, every, clearly everybody's, you know, contributing to this one. So clearly this is the real version of Cardano. Um, but it's not always that clear, especially early on. So imagine you see two versions of Cardano. One of them has a block made by this person. And then the other one has like two blocks made by different people. You don't know if it's just statistically by chance this one had two blocks 
and this one has one block and everybody's actually building on top of this one. Or you don't know if uh, the fact that this one had two blocks means everybody's built on top of this one. So from a wallet perspective and a DAP perspective, you don't know yet uh, with 100% accuracy which one is the true version of the Cardinal blockchain. You're going to have to give it some time, see which one uh, grows bigger, see which one has more people contributing to it. And so you can't know right away um, you know, which one is the real version of, of Cardano. Now, there are systems that allow to be able to tell right away um, which one is the true version of the history of a blockchain, but you, this is not possible in decentralized systems. So if you ever see somebody say like, oh, our blockchain has instant finality, it means that it, it's not a decentralized system. They have some way to tell right away which one is the true version of something, which one is the false version of something. And uh, instant finality is not available in Cardano. It's not available in Bitcoin. It's not available in Ethereum. And the reason we can't get instant finality, the reason we can't know which one is the true version of the blockchain right away is because as I described, to know which one is the true version, you have to kind of give it some time and see, you know, which one people pick as, as the true version of history. And so if you ever use Daedalus wallet or Yuroi wallet or any kind of wallet in, in, in crypto, when you make a transaction, after it gets sent, you usually see some sort of counter that says like blocks since this transaction occurred or some wallets show this as like an assurance level to say like, uh, there's a low probability that this transaction will be reversed, high probability this transaction will be reversed. Um, so every wallet has kind of a, a way to show this. Some wallets, you know, ignore entirely, but a lot of ways, a lot of wallets have a way to show this. And for example, in Bitcoin, uh, people usually recommend, you know, you wait six blocks uh, to get a, kind of have a good idea that this transaction is probably final and it won't be reversed. Uh, but because we don't have instant finality, you know, we have to tell to the user like, hey, your transaction's on the blockchain now, but you may have your transaction on the wrong chain. And that may be reversed and you go back and then go to this new version of the blockchain, which maybe doesn't have your transaction. Now, I know this is like uh, super complicated. Uh, hopefully with my example, you guys kind of got an intuitive understanding of, you know, why we can't have finality on decentralized blockchains. And hopefully with my explanation now, you get an idea of that uh, transaction assurance is a statistical thing. You know, you have some statistical, um, you have some probability that your transaction is accepted on the main chain, but it's nothing but, but a probability. And, you know, this, the six block heuristic that's used for Bitcoin, the reason they use six blocks is because it, it translates to a certain percentage assurance. I forgot the exact number of the pick, but let's say it's like 99% uh, assurance. So if, if your transaction has been included for six blocks, um, then you get a uh, 99% assurance that your transaction will actually be included. Now, uh, if you're kind of mathematically inclined, you may be wondering, well, how did they get to 99% assurance? This is a, a decentralized network. How do they you know, know that there's 99% assurance that actually the transaction will be included? And this is because there's a variable I haven't told you about, which is, so if you want to compute the assurance a percent chance that a transaction will stay and be part of the real version of the blockchain, you have to use not only number of blocks as an argument, but you also have to include the percentage of blocks made by adversarial actors. Adversarial actors being people who are not following the rules of the network, they are trying to attack the network. And the problem is that you, you can't know what percentage of the blockchain is adversarial. Right. So if you imagine, you know, on Bitcoin's case, it could be that 10% of the miners would love to attack the network if given the chance. But it could also be that well, maybe only 5% of people want to attack it. Or it could be that 0% of people want to attack it. You don't know um, how many people want to attack the network. And this is problematic because sometimes the number of people who want to attack the network is over 50%. And that's what is called the 51% attack. So whenever you see 51% attack, that means that over 50% of the people um, are actually behaving in an adversarial way and are trying to attack the network. And so uh, if you have over 50% of the network trying to attack the blockchain, you have no transaction assurance because no matter how long a chain gets, the adversary can make more blocks than you and override the history, right? And then this will become the real version of the transaction history. So this is why 51% attacks are dangerous because if somebody owns 51% of the network, they can basically undo history and create a new version of history with different transactions. And people use this to attack exchanges. So basically they, they uh, send, you know, for example, Bitcoin to an exchange, sell the Bitcoin to the exchange, and then withdraw their money. 
Once they've gotten their money back, then they delete the history of the Bitcoin blockchain and create a new version of the Bitcoin blockchain with more uh, blocks in it. And so this becomes the real version and everybody has to move to this real version. And this real version does not include the transaction to the, um, to the exchange. So basically not only did they get money from selling their Bitcoin to the exchange, they then undid the history, create a new version of the history where they never send the ADA to the exchange. So the exchange loses all that uh, BTC. So this is why you see 51% attacks always attacking exchanges because this is um, the best target for taking advantage of these kinds of attacks. Now, 51% attacks are very common in proof of work blockchains. For example, ETC has been 51% attacked, you know, many times over the course of its history. A lot of the smaller proof of work blockchains also get 51% attacked over the, the course of their history. And this is a very real problem. Now, one of the benefits of the proof of stake ecosystem is that 51% attacks are much harder because it means that you need to have 51% of the coins of the network, right? Because in Cardano, for example, proof of stake, the number of blocks you make is tied to the amount of ADA you hold. So unless you hold over 51% of the staked ADA on the blockchain, it, you can't really pull off this kind of attack. Um, however, as I mentioned, you don't need 51% of the network. Even with you know 5%, 10% of the network, you're already starting to affect transaction assurance, right? So if we can assume that 0% of people are okay with attacking a blockchain, nobody wants to, sorry, nobody wants to do this kind of attack, the transaction assurance in Cardano is pretty fast. Um, but the more people want to you know, take advantage of this uh, uh, mathematical fact in a sense, and look for opportunities to attack the protocol, the longer it takes uh, to get assurance that a transaction will be included and, uh, and always included inside the blockchain. So I, I won't give you kind of exact numbers right now, um, but the, the point is that uh, if you look at pools right now in Cardano, for example, Binance owns like 10% uh, of all staked ADA into the pools that are run by their exchange, right? And so if you're writing a DAP on Cardano, well, you have to assume at least, you know, 10% of the stake could be adversarial, 10% of the blocks could be adversarial, because Binance at some point could decide to attack the Cardano blockchain. Now, I'm sure Binance is a legally registered company. They have no interest in doing this, um, but it's something that you have to take into account. Now, fortunately, fortunately, with 10%, it doesn't affect the finality too much. This is not like a disaster situation. It's not like it will, you know, make dApps unusable on Cardano. Um, but obviously, the smaller the number, the better. And so, you know, we can't know who runs which pools. We can't know, you know, how decentralized the Cardano blockchain is really because for the same reason, we can't know how much of the blockchain is adversarial, you can make guesses and you can look and you know see how many people run, how many pools. And if some, somebody's running like 10 pools, they have a, a better uh, chance of trying to attack the network. And maybe you think they're adversarial, but maybe they're honest. You know, it's kind of a, a complicated nuanced discussion, um, but I think everybody's on the same page that to improve this problem, to make it as, as good as possible, the best thing you can do is spread out um, ADA amongst as many people as possible. So the more people um, are included in the block making, the harder it is to corrupt a certain set of individuals to attack the network. And so with that, um, you know, if you look at some of the other pools like 1% pool that owns a fairly uh, large amount of ADA, then you have to, as you're writing your DAP, think, okay, well, imagine 1% pool decides to attack my DAP. Um, how do I protect my users um, and, and in the UI for my website, tell users that transactions are only final after a certain amount of time has passed, like maybe five minutes. And, you know, the reason you have to do this is because 1% owns so many um, stake pools. And if that stake pool is split amongst uh, more stake pool operators, operators, you'd have more confidence that, um, you know, you can get away with a small transaction insurance and tell users that their transactions have been approved um, sooner than later. So this is uh, hopefully gave you a good understanding of transaction finality, transaction assurance, and how state pools kind of affect the transaction assurance of the Cardano blockchain. And now let's talk about solutions to this problem. So obviously this, as I mentioned, this problem affects Bitcoin, it affects Ethereum, it affects Cardano. And how can we solve this problem other than just, you know, trying to get more honest state pool operators? Well, for, there's, there's kind of two ways to do it. One of them is better tooling for dApps. And actually at DC Spark, we're working on a project called the, the Multiverse. 
And basically what this project is meant to do is it's meant to create a program that um, DAP can run. And it basically allows their DAP to look at every single version of the Cardinal blockchain at the same time. So like I mentioned earlier, there could be two versions of the Cardinal blockchain. There's a common prefix and then one version everybody's building on top of it and the other version has just one person. It could be that your transaction where you're imagining you're sending ADA to a DAP, it could be their transactions included in the version of the blockchain with just a single person and the version of the blockchain with everybody else. If your transaction is present in both versions of the history, it doesn't matter which one will end up being the real version of the blockchain, your transaction is, is included regardless. Okay, and so the multiverse is basically a program that will allow dApps to not only sync one version of the Cardano blockchain, but allow them to sync multiple versions of the Cardano blockchain at the same time. And then they'll be able to look at transactions that people make using their dApp and see if their transaction occurs in every single fork of the blockchain that is currently existing. And if it is, then they can tell their users, okay, you don't have to wait longer, your transaction will be included um, with pretty high assurance. And so if you think it's an interesting idea and if, if you think dApps will benefit from this, definitely check out Catalyst Fund 6 and look for DC Spark's proposal called Multiverse. I think it's, it's called like uh, Multiverse DApp Rollback Handler, I believe is the name of the proposal. I'll link a, I'll link the proposal inside the YouTube description. I'll link this on Twitter as well. Um, and this will definitely help dApps tackle this problem. Now, another way that you can tackle this problem is by creating either layer twos or um, state channels that have different uh, properties for finality. And so you may have heard of Hydra, which is a project by IOSK to be able to create basically a state channel, do transactions really fast, and then settle the state channel back on the Cardano mainnet. Now, one of the benefits of Hydra, one of the benefits of doing this kind of state channel is that it gives you much higher finality. And so even if you look at layer two solutions on Ethereum as well, one of the reasons people are making layer twos on Ethereum is not just for lower gas costs you might get from this kind of layer two solution, but one of the main points that they always appeal to to the community is that with our layer two solution, you get faster finality. And Hydra is the same way. We get faster finality through Hydra. Obviously it works totally different um, from what's happening in Ethereum. It's you know, totally new research and it works with you know, Plutus and it's a totally different thing. But the end goal is still very similar. We need to make a, a, you know, side chains and layer two solutions that have lower um, gas costs and higher finality to mitigate this problem. So that you know, if you want fast finality for whatever application you're doing, for example, if you're running a DEX and you need uh, users to as quickly as possible know the transaction is finalized and they can go on and make the next trade and the next trade and the next trade, um, state channels often uh, provide a, a good way to do this and Hydra is meant to kind of tackle this problem. Uh, and obviously Hydra has its own you know, set of, of trade-offs uh, now I won't go into into this video because it's, it's you know a very complicated protocol and you know I can make a whole separate video about this in the future but I believe I will talk about Hydra quite extensively during the Cardano Summit later this month so if you want to learn more about Hydra and how your dApp can use Hydra to provide a faster um, user experience for users of your dApp definitely check out the Cardano Summit. So that's it. that's that's the discussion we went over the problem description of the problem how pools and Cardano affect finality and transaction insurance. And then we went over two problem, uh, two solutions to this problem that DC Spark is working on, IOSK is working on. If you have any questions about this, you can hit me up anytime on Twitter, on Telegram. We actually have a DC Spark Discord now. So you can actually go to the DC Spark Discord and message me or anybody else in the DC Spark team anytime. And I'm always happy to have these kind of technical discussions to kind of explain uh, blockchain and, and the nuanced technical problems that happen in decentralized networks. And thank you very much.